Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we're uh, back with our dear friend Romeo here. And uh, he's excited again to the next Bible study. But as always, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this time to be here, God. Super grateful, Lord, just for the experience we get to build every Wednesday night, God. As uh, first principles classes, God, is not just some program that we're walking through, but we want to be equipped, Father. We want to be effective. We want to make more disciples. God, we want to see this world turn upside down for you. God, we, we just pray for an incredible uh, time here tonight, God. And uh, God, we, we also understand that we don't graduate from discipleship, but it is our lifestyle. We love you, and I pray, God, for uh, deep-rooted convictions tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, you know, we're, we're sitting down with Romeo again, and uh, he, he wants to see God with all his heart. He's willing to make the Bible the standard. And he always want to make sure, again, a quick little review. Hey, what do you remember from yesterday? And Romeo will share something along the lines. Like, I remember uh, something about, like the Bible being, like, sharper than a double-edged sword or something like this. Like, yeah. I think the notes said the truth hurts. Romeo, whatever the notes. Yeah, I did. That's awesome. Romeo, how's your quiet time going? Well, I'm in John chapter 3 now, and uh, Jesus met with this guy named uh, Nicodemus or something like this. And that's awesome. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, we got to get a quiet time together tomorrow morning, Romeo. Uh, but today we're going to jump into our next topic, and that is discipleship. And, uh, you know, so far, when we understand, we, we have to match our life to the doctrine. And so right now is an opportunity to see what is that doctrine that we're going to match our life to. So let's look at our theme passage. Go to Matthew 28. Go to Matthew 28. Now, Romeo, we're going to work this Bible study like, you know, you ever seen those movies where it starts with the last scene of the film, and then it says like 24 hours earlier, and it walks you how it got to that point? This Bible study will be similar to that experience as we're starting at the end of Jesus' ministry, you know, walk our way back to the beginning of it and see what do we learn from this? Before we read this, Romeo, we need to understand this right here is after Jesus had died, been buried, and resurrected. And he's about to ascend to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. So this is a pretty, pretty amazing moment here. And he's going to share his last words with his disciples. Now, Romeo, if you know for a fact these are going to be your last words, wouldn't you agree that they're super important? Absolutely. Right. You wouldn't waste these last words on feed my goldfish. Amen. Or don't forget to throw out the trash. There would be something even greater, something important, something memorable. What does Jesus say for his last words? Matthew 28, verse 16. Come on, bro. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Hopefully, you know, nobody here is doubting this evening. But there's two options here. Either you're worshipping God and you're fired up, or you're on the other side as a doubter. No, what, what's his uh, solution to their doubt? Look at verse uh, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wow. Now, it's quite interesting what we see here is he gathers up on Mount Galilee with his 11 disciples. Why 11? Well, Judas had died at this point. And he gives them specific 
instructions. Yeah. But before that, he says, guys, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's saying, I'm God. I am God in the flesh. I have authority in heaven, on earth. And now here's the thing. Go. Go and make disciples. Not stay here and stay seated and be a couch potato Christian and hope people kind of just come to you. I'm saying, go. I love the Mark translation of this. Mark parallel says, go into all the world. That is not enough just to go into Lincoln. But we are actually called to go to every single nation in the world. And he says, for them to become what, Romeo? Disciples. Mm. Exactly. He wants the whole world, all nations, Mm -hmm. to become disciples. Now, what's quite interesting, Romeo, the popular term for a follower of Christ is Christian. Right? Well, why is that? And that's what we're going to really dive into this evening is, what is the distinction, if any, between Christian and disciple? Now, for yourself, Romeo, I'm going to write it right here. How do you define Christian? You know, he'll say something along the lines, well, I think Christian is somebody who believes. You know, they believe, they go to church on Sunday, okay. You know, maybe, maybe uh, they, they definitely pray, they pray. Um, and, and I think that's really awesome. Okay, so someone who's a Christian, someone who believes, they go to church on Sunday, and they pray. Now, how would you define a disciple, Romeo? Well, a disciple, I mean, these guys, they're, they're committed, these guys are really committed. Uh, they evangelize. And uh, they, they know their Bibles. Okay. So we have your two definitions here. For yourself, Romeo, would you say that you're a Christian right now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm definitely a Christian. Okay. How long have you been a Christian for? Well, I, I've been a Christian for really my whole life. Really, my whole life. All right. Whole life. Now, would you say you're a disciple of Jesus? Mm. No, but I'm on my way. I'm on my way to become a disciple. That's awesome. Now, Romeo, if I'm on my way to become a student at UNL, am I a student yet? Well, well, no. Okay, so you're not a disciple, but you want to be. That's, that's awesome. And I think the study is going to really help you on this journey. But okay, so you're not a disciple yet. Okay, we're going to really dive into these concepts here and let the Bible define these terms for us. We'll come back to this later. Romy, if I were to ask you how many times the word Christian appears in the Bible, what would you say? Uh, zero times? You know, close. Actually, three times. It appears three times, and towards the end of the Bible study, I want to show you the first time it appears. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Now, how many times do you think the word disciple appears in the Bible? A lot. Okay. You're definitely right. It definitely isn't there a lot. It's over 270 plus times. And so tonight, what we're going to do is really study out what is a disciple. As we see in the Great Commission, he wants all nations to become disciples. And that's you and I. Romeo, how do you feel about that? I'm ready. I'm excited. Awesome. Let's go to uh, three years earlier. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now we're going to get characteristics of what a disciple is. Now what's really awesome, uh, guys, is for us, what makes us different from any other ministry out here is that discipleship aren't a class course that we teach. Discipleship is not just some program and then you get a certificate to hang on your wall. But what makes us different is we believe discipleship is meant to be a lifestyle. It's not what we do, but it's who we are. That's what makes us different. And tonight we're going to really learn what is the lifestyle 
of a disciple. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. It says, as Jesus was walking, or as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here we see Jesus calls his first disciples. And he's walking by the Sea of Galilee. And he sees these fishermen down by the shore. And he walks up to them. Now, Romeo, what is the purpose of a fisherman? I guess to fish. <laughs> exactly. Right, right. The purpose is to fish. Right. It's a fishy business. Their life revolves around fish, talking about great catches. They have trophies of fish hanging on their walls. They got fishes in their fridge. They probably even smell like fish. Everything revolves around fish for these men. And that's how we can tell that that's what their purpose is. See, today in our society, so many people say that their purpose is this, that, or the third, but then when you see their life, it does not match what they're saying. But as we know, actions speak louder than words. And so we want to see, okay, action-wise, what is my purpose? What does my life consist of? Romeo, what would you say your purpose in life is? Like, what, what, is it, what, what does your life revolve around right now? They say we to follow you around for a whole week. What would we come to a conclusion of what your purpose is. Uh, that I'm just, you know, a college student trying to get a degree. Exactly, okay. So, you know, Romeo's a, a college student just trying to get a degree. Awesome. Or maybe Romeo, uh, let's say Romeo says instead, hey, I'm just a guy uh, who works a nine-to-five job, you know, and just clocks in, clocks out, goes home, maybe hits the gym and rinse and repeat. Okay, so he's a, a typical, uh, uh, you know, blue-collar type guy or white-collar type guy. Okay, uh, so that's what he put down there. Now, Jesus comes into these men's lives and changes their purpose. Right. He says, no longer are you to fish for fish, but now you're to come follow me, and I would send you out to fish for men. In the Greek here, it actually says, come follow me, and I will make you to become a fisher of people. Wow. wow. In other words, these guys, Romeo, how much do they know about making disciples? Nothing. Right. They do absolutely not a zero zip. Yet, how long does it take for them to follow Jesus? Immediately. Wow. Right. At once. They dropped their nets and followed him. See, that, that's what a, 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 the call is. That's our first characteristic of a disciple is they follow Jesus. They have quiet times, absolutely. But they also go out and make more disciples. They go out and change the world. This is the lifestyle, the ebb and flow of discipleship. Why do these guys respond to the call of Christ? Not because they knew how, not because they were equipped, not because it was an awesome kind of way he put it, you know, figures of men, wow, that's really cool, let me follow this guy. Like, could you imagine just going up to a Starbucks worker saying, hey, come follow me, I'm going to teach you how to make disciples. And they're like, sure, they just clock out, you know, maybe, not, maybe they don't even clock out, they just walk out, you know what I mean? Why do they follow this guy? Not because of all the what's or the what is or the how's, but because of the who. They knew it was Jesus, the Messiah, who was calling them. Now, Romeo, we just learned, what does Jesus want all nations to become? Well, disciples. Right. So what does he want you to become? A disciple. Okay. So, Romeo, you have the who just like they did. So now what's the, the call is, are you willing to drop your nets? to come follow Jesus and be taught on how to make more disciples. And this is going to be our first characteristic here. 
is that disciples make disciples. Romeo, do you want to make this your purpose in life? Yeah, absolutely. Sounds awesome. Okay, let's look at our next characteristic. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. It was interesting, Romeo. We saw the second batch of brothers there in the last passage, and they didn't just uh, leave their little boat. But if you notice, who did they leave behind? Their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. So the family business. Wow. So we do see that Jesus expected these guys to answer solely on the who, that that was enough. Yeah. That the words of God spoke, that's it. When the Bible speaks, we are silent. We just obey. Come on, Eric. Oh. Yeah. And they left their father and their family business. Yeah. Luke chapter 9. Let's get our second characteristic. Come on. Yeah, bro. And verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Here we see Jesus talking to a large crowd, says, whoever wants to be my disciple, who's whoever, anyone, anyone. It does not matter if you're a pastor. It does not matter if you're the pastor's kid. There is no Groupon deal to go to heaven. If you personally want to be my disciple, you must. What does the word must imply? It implies there is no other option. Yeah. There is only one way. Yeah. Now, what is the one way? What is the must here? You must deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Yeah. Now, Romeo, the word deny is to say no. You, know, you try to log into your account. You forgot your password. Your access denied. They're not going to let you in. Same idea, when you deny yourself, you're saying no to self. Yeah. No to your selfish desires, your sinful desires. No to anything that maybe may seem good, but is actually against the words of Christ. Amen. And take up your cross daily. Now, Romeo, we need to understand here that for these guys, during this period, they didn't think of Jesus dying on the cross for them when they heard the cross, because it hadn't happened yet. So when they hear cross, they hear capital punishment. Wow. It's almost like some guy coming up to you right now saying, Hey, Romeo, you want to come follow me, dude? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, then you got to sit in the electric chair and turn that puppy on. You're like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't know. I, I'm not going to follow you no more. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is he says, do this daily. Well, if I do this today, I can't do it tomorrow because I'm dead. So he's not saying physically, but he's saying you got to die to yourself. There has to be a dead Romeo before me. So that Christ can live through Romeo. Eric must die so that Jesus can live. And that's what he goes on to explain. You want to save your life? That's fine, but he knows what's going to happen. You end up losing it, forfeiting your soul for eternity in hell. What good is that? It's right. not good. Right, Instead, lose your life. Live for me. Come on. And you get eternity. Come on, Eric. If you look you know, at a rope, imagine there's like a long rope going off the, the stage here. Many people live for this little tip right here. Not realizing there's eternity to go. And they're so caught up in preserving this little strip right here. Not realizing that there's so much more beyond this. Yeah. And Jesus is telling them, hey, if you're my disciple, you're willing to let go and trust God, and you'll get eternity with me in heaven. Wow. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah. There's a third thing that we learn from this passage, and that's if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. Yeah, see, see, there's no such thing as a closet disciple. 
They, they don't share it. They don't want to be out and loud and proud about it. No, disciples, this is their lifestyle. People should really see it. I mean, it's really cool. Working where I'm working right now to help us pay off some debt that Gabby and I have, I've gotten a nickname. You know what they call me? They call me Rev. You know what Rev stands for? Reverend. I'm like walking my earbuds, you know, cleaning, whatever. And Rev! I'm like, yes? <laughs> hey, man, how's it going reading the Bible? What you learned today? What you got today? Oh, bro, I'm reading this parable, bro. It's really cool. <laughs> and you're like, they got to know who you are. Yeah. Like, you're a disciple. Come on. I want everybody here to get a nickname at your workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Get a nickname in your classrooms. Get a nickname at, at that coffee shop that you're a regular to. Ooh. See, you can't be ashamed. Come on, bro. Come on. So we learned there's, there's a, a three piece to this second characteristic, and that's that disciples deny self, carry cross daily, and are unashamed. Now, what's interesting here. Romeo, is this is the what. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm more of a how guy. Like, how do we do this? And sometimes that can be a, a bit of a danger, but other times it's really helpful. And, you know, we look at this, guy, that's awesome. That's what I got to do, but how do I do it? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Matthew 26. Take him to Matthew, bro. Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with them, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, and not as I will, but as you will. Here we see... Two, two main practicals on how Jesus denied himself to literally take up his cross physically. Here, moments before being arrested and being crucified, we see that Jesus did not want to die. Yeah, come on. He don't want to do it. He don't want to submit. He don't want to obey. Amen. So what does he do? He just acts fake about it? No. Denying yourself is not being fake. Hmm. What does he do? He deals with his emotions. Oh, come on, bro. He oh, deals come on. with his rebellious thoughts. Yeah, yeah. How does he do it? Well, he pulls together Peter, John, James. Guys, I'm feeling a lot. I'm overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of that. Pray for me. And then he leaves them and goes and falls to the ground on his knees and prays to God. And now does he just say the right things to God? It's like, God, you're awesome. You're incredible. I'm about to die for mankind. I mean, I love, I love the fact I get to serve this way. It's going to be awesome. No. He's real. He's real. He's genuine. He goes, I don't want to die. I don't want to drink this cup. Is there any other way? I'll do it. Just give me a different way, God. Please. Please make this easier. Another way where we can actually save mankind. I don't have to go through this pain. I don't have to sacrifice so much. Any other way. <sighs> but not my will, God, but your will be done. Ultimately, God, I know this is the only way. I know it is. I know it is. But I wanted to be real with you. I didn't want to do it. And I'm sorry for thinking I have, I have a better perspective than you. I'm sorry that my ways seemingly thought they were better than your ways or my thoughts better than your thoughts, God. This is not true. You, you are king. Let your will be done. Come on, Eric. Come on. 
If you read this, he prays three hours that night until his heart changed, until he submitted his thoughts to the word. And he said, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He was ready to die. He denied himself. And he literally took up his cross moments later. So, Romeo, how are we to do this? Well, the how is two parts, right? The how is be real with disciples, but also be real with God. Now, the thing, Romeo, is not one or the other. It's one and the other. If Jesus, who is both Lord and Savior and is perfect, he had to do this. How much more, you and I, do we need to be real with disciples and be real with God? Now, let's go on and get our next characteristic. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. In Luke 9, verse 57, yes, sir. it says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus replied. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Let's pause there real quick, Romeo. Here we see a dude is fired up, excited to follow Jesus. He says, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Just say it, just name it, I'll be there. I'll be there even early. 10 a.m. church, I'll be there at 9 a.m. Jesus says, hey, uh, buddy, that's awesome. But here's the thing. Foxes have dens, birds have nests. These creatures have homes. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Well, I don't know about you, where do you lay your head? I lay it on a queen-size mattress, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's pretty comfortable. You know, I got some pillows as well. Especially after a long day and those pillows are nice and cold. It's the best. It's the best. He says the sentiment has no mattress. The sentiment has no nice cold pillow waiting at him after a long day. In other words, if you want to follow Jesus... Is going to be an uncomfortable lifestyle sometimes. So, buddy, I know you're fired up, but I just want to make sure you're not emotionally high and you understand the gravity of what you're signing up for. That this is not just sincerity, but it's total commitment. Look at the second guy. Says he said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Here, this man had to be called to follow him. And Jesus says, uh, dude, come on. Come follow me. Let's go. What are you doing? Sitting around? No, let's go. He says, well, teacher, I, I would come follow you, but let me just go bury my dad first. It's a very sensitive topic. Yeah. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Could you imagine if today a preacher said that to one of their church members? Know what happened? It'd be blown up all over the internet. It'd be on the news reports. We got a, a, a cult church here in Lincoln, Nebraska. It, it'd make, you know, breaking news. But yeah, Jesus did that. Yet Jesus expected that commitment. There's so many people out there who like to say this kind of uh, uh, comment or phrase or statement, if you will. It says, man, if, it would, if Jesus walked into your church, would he, would he actually want to be a part of that church? If Jesus walked into your church, will he say, this is definitely the church I built before I left? Wow. Or will he just walk out and say, that's not my church? Wow. So many people like to say that. But that, that, that's all it is, it's a statement. Mm. But for us here tonight, on, it has to be our lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. That we understand that there's a call to total commitment. Yeah. Come on, it, it's funny, we're called the sold-out discipling movement. Yeah. 
which was a little bit of uh, redundant, right? Because right. disciples are sold out. So it's almost like we're the disciple disciple movement is what we're saying. We're the sold out sold out movement. We're called to be sold out. And Jesus is telling this guy, let those who are spiritually dead bury the physical dead. I didn't bury them. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, for myself, I actually had my cousin pass away here in January. And unfortunately, he did not die a disciple. He did not make it into the light. And I shared my faith with him constantly many times before. And you know what his response was? When I'm 50. When I'm 40. You know what age he died at? 25. He died at age 25. And in a sense, from the worldly perspective, yet his life ahead of him. But here's the thing. We have no time to waste. We have no time to waste. Yes, mourn for the dead. Absolutely. But don't let that slow you down in making disciples. See, for me, my cousin is but a catalyst. He's but another reason why I'm going to be totally committed and make more disciples. Because somebody out there, somebody else's cousin, somebody else's brother, somebody else's relative and friend, and they all need to become disciples of Jesus. And the last guy is this. So another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who has put their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Here, this third one, I like to imagine he's probably standing nearby a little bit, you know what I mean? And he sees the emotionally high guy walk off the scourge, the guy who had a, a long week planned of uh, uh, a funeral going on. Say, hey, man, here are my condolences. Uh, but Jesus, for me, just give me five minutes. Just five minutes. Don't move. Don't, don't, don't go nowhere. I'll, I'll be right back. My, my house is just down the block. I'm going to just run over there, grab my Nintendo Switch real quick, say goodbye to my family, and then I'll be on my way. I'll be right behind you. See, where this guy messed up is that word but. Anything after but just nullifies the first part of it. I will follow you, but. You know what's interesting too? He said, I will follow you, Lord, but. You know what Lord means? It means that he's king. It means that he's master. It means that whatever he says, that's it. You don't negotiate with the Lord. You don't negotiate with the king, the prince of princes. You said it, you do it. But first, he says that you don't get it either. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow, what's the plow? Our, our modern day tractors. They make those straight lines in the crops in the field. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow, looks back. It's not fit for service in the kingdom of God. What happens when you look back while you're driving a tractor? Well, you end up curving. And your straight line ain't straight no more. Not only that, you've ruined the field. The whole thing now is going to have to be restarted again. So he says, dude, you're making a rash decision, number one. Number two, I'm not really your Lord. And number three, being a disciple is going to be a lot of tough work. So put your Nintendo Switch back. And number four, you can't look back to your old life. You got to close all those back doors and be totally committed. So what is our third characteristic here of a disciple? Disciples are totally committed. They are sincere and committed. Right? Let's go to our next one. Romeo, do you want to be uh, sincere and committed? Yes. Awesome. Let's go to Luke 14. Luke 14. Verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, 
Brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Let's pause there. Here, Jesus is talking to another large crowd. Whoever, again, anyone, wants to be my disciple, and they do not hate their father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children. It's even their own life. What is he teaching here, Romeo? Romeo's looking at it, he's... Nah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, no, what, what do you think? Is he saying I hate them? Yeah. yeah. He's saying that yeah. hate your family. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. Even your own self. <laughs> <laughs> or you cannot be my disciple. See, I, I do believe many of us, we grew up seeing Jesus as this long-haired, conditioned dude with a flower band around his hair, just kind of holding it back, with a peace necklace around his, his neck. And he's just doing the peace sign. Maybe even holding a baby lamb or a baby boy in the other arm, blessing it. And we're like, no way he said hate. I didn't even know that was in his vocabulary. But we fail to forget that that same guy was actually crucified. And that's actually a very watered-down uh, picture of Jesus. Right. Jesus is a revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus came to change the world. Right. Jesus came to call everybody back to the root, right. back to God. And here he's saying, you got to hate them. The word hate just means to love less. Well, love less compared to who? Compared to God. That as disciples, we're called to love God more than anyone else. Yes, even our own self. Yeah. So that's what a disciple does. Now it's interesting for myself, Romeo. I've experienced this passage, actually. I remember the first year back in 2015, I became a disciple. It was my mom, my dad, my little brother's birthdays that all fell on Sunday. What are the odds? Well, we learned that there's no such thing as coincidences. I was predestined by God himself. And uh, you know, they wanted me to skip church on Sunday morning to go celebrate the entire day with them. You know what I told them, Romeo? What would you tell them? I said, no. I said, I'm going to go to church. And I'll be, I'll be there afterwards. So I, I'll be there in the morning. I'm going to take off around 9 a.m., so I can get there by 10. I had to do a one-hour commute during this time. And church will be done by 12. I'll be back home by 1 p.m. And I'll spend the rest of the night with you guys. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. I did that for my, my brother's birthday. I did that for my mom's birthday. The last one was my dad's birthday. My mom called me. She said, hey, I know you, you went to church for my birthday and your little brother's birthday, but not for your dad. You're not going to go to church. You're going to be here from morning till evening. I said, Mom, I, I, I love you a ton. And, you know, I want to honor you and respect you. Uh, but I am going to go to church still. I want to prioritize my walk, my relationship with God. And we can hang out all day Monday. We can hang out all day Saturday. But I'm going to go to church that Sunday morning. She said, Eric, it feels like you hate us. You know what I found interesting is I never said I love you to my family growing up. I hated being touched or hugged or anything like this. They put, my dad used to like to put his hand on my shoulder and said, get off me. That's how I treated them. And then I became a disciple. You know what happened? I learned to deny myself and say, I love you. I learned to deny myself and embrace the hugs of my own father. And still yet, my mom said, it feels like you hate us. Why? Because they're no longer sitting in the throne of kingship, of lordship in my life, but now the true king has taken his throne in my life. And they didn't like it. But you know, you fast forward nine years later, and they thank me for it. And they respect me for it. 
and they want to know more about God. They read their Bibles more. They pray more. My dad has fasted. Never done that before. Because of the commitment to Christ. So here we get our fourth, which is disciples love God more than anybody else. Disciples love God more. What is our next one? Let's keep reading here. Verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. And here we see Jesus now uh, telling a story. If you want to follow me, here's the thing. Consider a man who wants to build a tower. When he first sat down and considered, can I actually build this thing from bottom up? Can I complete this task? Come to cost. Here, Romeo is talking to the emotional people. He's saying, think hard. Yeah. Consider. Don't just make a rash decision. Mm, yeah. Don't do it because, man, this group looks really cool and fun. I like the way this dude, like preaches the word, man. That's why I'm here with this group. No, no, no. Think hard. Because it's actually for Jesus. It's going to be a lifetime commitment from today to your last breath. Are you sure? And the cool thing here, here's where it kind of breaks off a little bit from the illustration. The, the question is not, can you pay it? But is, will you? Because you can. Yeah. Everybody can. Come on, Eric. It's more a matter of will Come on, or won't. Yeah. Right, right. So, Romeo, how do you feel about this? Are you willing to pay the cost to be a disciple for the rest of your life? Mm. Absolutely. Sounds, sounds challenging, but I want to do it. I don't see any other option. All right. So we learn here from this one, disciples make a lifetime commitment. Yeah. Lifetime commitment. Let's read the next one here. Verse 31. Or suppose the king is about to go to war against another king. When he first sat down and considered whether he was able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000, if he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who did not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. See, what's interesting here, Romeo, he that kind of switches gears and he talks about this first king with 20,000. Going to war against another king, the second king, of 20,000. Oh, here we got 10,000, sorry. It says, wouldn't this guy, shouldn't he sit down and consider, can I actually defeat this guy? Yeah. So he's bringing back the tower concept. Yeah. He should think hard. Okay, he's considered. There's no way I can beat this guy. Numbers game, he beats me. So then he should send a delegation while the other one's still a long way off. Well, why a long way off? Well, Romeo, when the second king gets over here, what does that mean? Well, it means war. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's too late. There's no turning back at that point. Yeah. He did not make this guy walk all his distance to say, just kidding. Yeah. It's not going to work. So you want to catch him, let's just say halfway, and you got to ask for terms of peace. You don't make the terms. you got to ask him for the terms. What are the terms of peace? You know what he says? Give up everything. Wow. Romeo, who do you think the second king represents? Which king will be victorious no matter what? Well, that's God. Absolutely. This is God. So who, who's the first king? That's me. Right. I mean, more specifically, it says in verse 33, in the same way those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. These are those who are not disciples. Yeah. Now, Romeo, how, how many ways is there to be saved? Well, there's only one way. 
Exactly. There's only one way to be saved. You know what many people do today? They walk here, they see what the cost is, and they want to go around. This does not work. Why? Because that is a second way, which we just agreed is the only one way. But number two, you're actually avoiding peace with God. So it's very unpeaceful. It's going to be filled with anxiety, filled with concerns. But also, if this is a war illustration, this is considered an attack. You're actually attacking God's truth. So you can't go this way. Now, looking at this right here, if we were to draw a line on the middle, Romeo, where would you, would you say that you are at currently? Well, I, you know, I think I'm like right here. I'm, I'm on my way. I'm not like there yet, but I'm on my way. I'm not, I'm not all the way back here yet. That's awesome, Romeo. That's good. That's good. Now, where do you want to be? I want to be over here. Come on. Romeo, that, that, that's actually the, the more important question there, and that's awesome. Because if you don't have a goal, you don't have a destiny, you just stay stuck there. Now, the cool thing is that these Bible studies, Romeo, are meant to help you understand that bridge through Jesus Christ, through his word, and how to go from the first king to the second king's side. So let's study the Bible more in depth every day and see, okay, what does it really truly mean to be a disciple? So far, we've gathered about five characteristics but there's more that we can come up with through the scriptures. And here, Romeo, we need to understand something very, very important here. And that's that this illustration is for the thinkers. That now he's saying, hey, that's good that you're thinking hard, but don't take too long. Yeah. Why? You don't know when that second king will be at your doorstep. Right. You don't know when you're going to pass away. You don't know where you're going to die. It could be at 18 years old. It could be at 80 years old. You don't know. So therefore, think fast. Now, Romeo, people can say, well, then, then God's a monster. He's like a bully trying to take my lunch money. He's got more than me. Why does he want mine? Well, Romeo, if somebody killed your son, how would you feel? I'd be angry. Right, that's an understatement. Yeah. Would you ever adopt the murderer of your son into your family? Wow. Never. Mm. It won't happen. Yeah. Right. You know what's interesting? God's willing to adopt you, the murderer of his son, because wow. of your sins, wow. into his family. Wow. This right here is called adoption. He's trying to save you from destruction. You're going to destroy yourself. He just come and join my side. Yeah. My son died for you. So this is actually grace. And so now, for you, Romeo, you need to understand, the real important question is, how quickly do you want to go from the first king to the second king's side? Today. Come on. Romeo, that's awesome. Let's do some more Bible studies, and it's going to really help cement your faith in your walk with God here. Amen? Amen. Well, let's look at one other characteristic. Go to John 13. John 13, verse 34. It says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now here we see very, very interestingly, Jesus says, a new command I give to you. What makes this command new? Well, there's three things that makes it new. Number one, he's saying, you disciples love one another. He's not saying you disciple love Johnny who's at the grocery store who's not a disciple. No, no. You guys right here in this inner room, um, I just washed your feet. We just dried them off. You guys love each other. Why? So that those who are not disciples 
will know that you are my disciples by your love for each other. So the person, the object of whom you're to love changed from your neighbor to your disciples. And the measure of love has changed from love them as uh, you love yourself to now love them as Christ loved them. Wow. Well, what did Christ do? He laid down his life for them. So what are we called to do for one another as disciples? To lay down our life for each other. Yeah. And what's the purpose of it? Not just to obey the law of Moses, but now it is to make more disciples. Wow. So that many people outside this group would say, whoa, wait, you guys are friends? Wait, aren't you a tax collector? Aren't you a zealot? How are you guys like buddy-buddy? Like you guys are practically brothers. Well, there's these Bible studies. I think you'd really love them. See, that's the purpose of it. So, Romeo, what, what I want to encourage you with is we really do fight to be family. And if you want to be a disciple, get on this side, we're willing to lay down our life for you. And that's not meant to be some cute little slogan to like sell you something, but it's the scriptures and how we're to make it our lifestyle. That's the point of it. So our last one, for a second time I won't write it, is disciples love other disciples. Now, Romeo, look at the first time that the word Christian appears. So go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And verse 25. Since then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year... Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So according to this right here, what were the disciples called, Romeo? They were called Christians. Right. See, Christian was but a nickname for a disciple. That's all it was. It was like police officers, we call them cops. Same deal. Yeah. Stephen, we call him Steve. Hey, Mr. Zachary, we call him Zach. Mr. Michael, we call him Mikey. You know, so it's a nickname. Right. It's the same deal. Same thing. They're interchangeable. Therefore, Romeo, if I'm not a disciple, I'm not a Christian. How do you feel about this? It's like, whoa, I had, I had no idea. It, this is, I've never been taught this. Right, how do you feel about it? Are you willing to accept this? I mean, it's from the Bible. So yeah. Now, what's quite interesting uh, here, Romeo, is that everything we've looked at, all the characteristics of a disciple are the very same characteristics of a Christian. They're the exact same thing. So for yourself, Romeo, can we say that you're a Christian? Well, if, if I'm not a disciple, no, I'm not a Christian. How do you feel about that? I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, man. But I want to encourage you. I don't want this to be a condemning message for you, but more so a message of hope. Because at least you now know. It's better to be shocked now than be shocked when it's too late. And now we can actually do something about it. Now we can actually change it. But then it's going to be too late. Nothing can be changed. It would be sealed. So Romeo, this is an opportunity. It doesn't mean your life has been a waste. No, now, this is the perfect time. God has chosen you to be a disciple so that you too can have impact and change the world. That you were selected on the mission team to Lincoln, Nebraska. Not just like willy-nilly, but it was intentional. There was a design. It was orchestrated by God himself. 
effect. You can be the domino effect. It can be the chain reaction throughout the entire state of Nebraska. Now here's what's interesting, Romeo. We do see disciple equals Christian. Now what I put before you is somebody who's saved lives like this. Now we'll get deeper into salvation down the road here in our Bible study called Light and Darkness. But I want to put this before you that if we're not living like that, then we're not saved. But what's crazy, just because somebody lives like this does not mean they're saved. Because we're not saved by works. True. So we'll get deeper into that together in light and darkness. But we do see very clearly someone who's saved, it produces a lifestyle of this. Wow. Come on, Eric. So we'll get deeper into that. But Romeo, awesome. do you want to be a disciple? Absolutely. On, well, let's do it. Let's close out where we started. Go back to Matthew 28. Woo. Come on, Come on. Matthew 28. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You had any doubt at the beginning of this lesson? I hope it removed all doubt just now. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Wow. Now, Romeo, now we know exactly what he's saying. He's saying go make disciples. Go make Christians. Go make people that are going to make more disciples, are going to deny themselves, are going to love God more than anybody else, they're going to be totally committed and totally sincere. They're going to make this a lifetime commitment. Love other disciples. Make these people. And then baptize them. And teach them to obey everything. See, what we, what we have here is Jesus' style of ministry. That he wants us to change the world. Here you have a disciple, you know, Romeo, let's, let's say this is you. And then we have a preacher, his name is Preacher Bob. Preacher Bob, or, or Priest Billy, he's very charismatic. And every day for a whole year, he makes a church member. Not a disciple, but a churchgoer. So at the end of one whole year, you got 365 church members. Year two, same rhythm, same pattern, 730. Year three, 1095. In just three years, this preacher has created a mega church. That's pretty intense. He's got what they call gravitas. People just gravitate to him. All right. You have a disciple. Romeo, you know, let's say for a whole year, you're making a disciple, you're sharing your faith. Just to even get anybody to say yes to a Bible study, you got to share with like 30, 40 people a day. And from those you got to sit through who's actually serious, who actually wants it, who's not just emotionally high, who's not going to just sit in that thinking chair for the rest of your life and make no decision, but who's actually going to do something about it? Who's going to stand up and live for Christ after a whole year? Another guy is willing to do it, and his name is Stephen. So I have a total of two disciples. Year two, Romeo, you make another disciple, but so does Stephen. He makes Jayshon into a disciple. So there's a total of four disciples. Year three, well, they each make one because they're all disciples. It would be eight. Now we're eight guys sitting in Romeo's living room, picking our noses, looking across the street at this mega church. I'm like, man, what, is something off with what we're doing? Is this for real? Is this? I don't know. But Romeo, you got deep convictions, man. It is what the Bible says. We got to build it exactly the way Jesus told us on the mountain. And that's what we're going to do. One disciple at a time. Check, check, check out what happens here. The preacher guy, year 13, when you skip down, 4,000. 
745. You're 33. 12,045. That's about half this campus. In 33 years. But you, you go down the disciple route. After 13 years, 8,192. They actually double these guys. You're 33. 8 billion plus. If we do it Jesus' way, everybody will get a chance to sit down with the scriptures between them and another disciple and make their own educated decision as to whether they want to accept or reject God. You know, Romeo, we, we started our movement of disciples back in 2006. It started with about 40 disciples. And 18 years later, we have over 12,000 disciples internationally. Why? Because it is exponential growth. Disciples who make disciples versus religiosity, churchianity of today. Does this mean everybody will become a disciple? No. But everybody gets a chance. And that's what we're trying to do. And Romeo, that's what you get to be a part of. It's a family of churches around the world. How do you feel about this? I, I've never seen anything like this. I, I want to be a part of it. Well, Roman, let's keep doing some Bible studies here. Come on. And we want to make sure that your, 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 your faith is cemented and grounded yeah. in the Bible. Uh, with that, Romeo, that is a discipleship study. And let us pray out. Uh, Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this time. Uh, I pray, God, that you just be with us, God, tonight. Let us get home safely. Uh, be with those disciples, God, that uh, maybe need, you, need, need some uh, healing, God, uh, health-wise, God, maybe physically, mentally, emotionally, and or spiritually, God. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that you just help us, God, uh, get deeper roots. Allow us to grow in our effectiveness, God. Allow us to grow in our compassion. That we can go out, God, and just make more disciples. Lord, I believe that this is your word, this is your plan, and that it works. And the, the, the error, the issue, the mistake is not in you, it's not in Christ, it's not in the Spirit, and it's not in the Bible. But God, if it does not work, God, it is in us to be persistent and to change and adapt, God, and ask you for wisdom. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.